How many of you would like to lead somebody to faith in Jesus Christ? That's something that we would like to do. What do you think is the most important component in witnessing? Now, I imagine our first answer would be the Holy Spirit, and that's true. Uh, it's not something we do all on ourselves. The Holy Spirit must be at work in that person's life, drawing them in order for them to be saved. But aside from that, when you look at what our part is, when it comes to witnessing, what do you think is the most valuable tool? Is it an extensive knowledge of the scriptures? Is it a well-polished presentation of the gospel message? You might be surprised to know that it's neither of those things. The most important, the most effective tool in bringing somebody to faith in Jesus Christ is your personal testimony. Your story is going to mean more to people in bringing them to faith in Jesus. Now, I'm not saying we don't need the Scriptures or that we don't need to know how to communicate the plan of salvation, but I believe in the power of a personal testimony. And what we have in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 17 is a personal testimony of the Apostle Paul. It's not the only one he gives. In fact, there are three of them in the book of Acts. And he also uh, delves into a lot of his personal experiences and, and what we would call a testimony throughout the whole letter of 2 Corinthians. But in this passage, we see not only Paul's testimony, but some important elements for our own personal testimony. By its very nature, a testimony is unique. Our story is unlike any other story. And it's very simple. A testimony really involves three things. My life before Christ, how I came to Christ, and what Christ has meant to me since. That's it. Those three elements that's your story. That's your testimony. And there is nothing else that captures the interest and the attention of an unbeliever like someone's story. We, we want to hear about people. We want to know what people have gone through. And this is a very effective tool in sharing Christ with others. One of the great things about personal testimony is you can't argue against it. Okay? Now, you know, you can get into the scriptures and you can say, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. And people can argue that. They're wrong, but they can argue that. But when you share, this is where I was before Christ, and then and, and, and Christ got a hold of me, and this has been my life since, people aren't going to say, oh, I, that didn't happen. Oh, I don't believe that. That's where the personal aspect of our testimony comes in. And it's something that's irrefutable. I think a good example that you see uh, was, was the man that Jesus healed in John chapter 9. He'd been born blind. And um, after he was healed, of course, Pharisees got all bent out of shape because it was on the Sabbath and um, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they bring this guy in and they're questioning him. Who was it that healed you? Don't you know that this man you know, doesn't keep the Sabbath? Blah, blah. And the guy says, you know what, guys? I don't know anything. I don't know who he was. I don't know anything about him. Here's what I know. I was blind and now I can see. That was a personal testimony. I was blind. I came to Jesus and now I can see. <laughs> that, that's as simple as you can get. And they could not refute it. They just kicked him out because they didn't know what to do with him. So it's that it's really that simple. And, and if you think about his situation, he was kind of like a witness in a courtroom. 
And that's where we use that word testimony outside of the church. When you have a, a court proceedings, witnesses are called and they give their testimony. And what is their testimony? Well, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. This is what I experienced. This is what happened to me. And that is very powerful in bringing a verdict. I like what Rick Warren writes. He said, this is the essence of witnessing, simply sharing your personal experiences regarding the Lord. In a courtroom, a witness isn't expected to argue the case, prove the point, or press for the verdict. That's the job of the attorneys. Witnesses simply report what happened to them or what they saw. Doesn't that take a lot of the pressure off? Realizing that it's not all up to you, you don't have to have all the answers. You're not the one that has to prove your point. It's not up to your presentation to whether this person is saved or not. You just simply share what's happened. Jesus said to his followers just before he went back to heaven, not you will be my attorneys, right? He said, you'll be my witnesses. I just want you to go out there and tell people and show by your life what I've done for you. It's really kind of simple. We've made it something it was never intended to be. We've made it something scary. And it really doesn't have to be. God just wants us to share our story with others. And we don't have to be a Bible scholar, but we are an authority in our own life because we've lived it. And that's something we should have confidence in. Not confidence in ourselves in a bad sense, but I mean confidence in our story. This is what happened. This is what I have experienced in my life. And personal stories are easier to relate to than principles. I mean, you can go to somebody and say, you know, we've all sinned, we fall short of the glory of God, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All of that is true. And people are like, huh, wonder how long this is going to take. But when you share your story, when you share, hey, this is what happened to me, maybe they don't have the same experience as you did, but it's something they can relate to. And it's something that catches their interest. So as we continue to study 1 Timothy, I want to look at Paul's testimony that he gives in verses 12 through 17. In our last message, we emphasize the importance of maintaining the message. We need to stay true to God's Word and not misuse God's Word to try to bring about our, our own agenda. But in addition to staying doctrinally pure, we also need that personal touch. Being able to share our story and between our testimony and His truth, that's a powerful combination in seeing others being brought to Christ. So I want to look at three important characteristics of a personal testimony tonight out of these verses. First of all, a personal testimony is honest. Look at verses 12 through 14. Paul is writing, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now before we get into the details here, let me note that Paul begins and ends this testimony with a focus on Christ. Even though a testimony is by its very definition all about us, it's not to make us look good. It's to make him look good. And at every step of the way, Paul is consistently pointing the attention away from himself 
even though it's about him, but he's pointing the attention to Jesus. He starts off by saying, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. So Christ is central when we are giving our testimony. He begins with an appreciation for what Christ has done in his life. This is not a DIY project. This is not a self-help issue. And that's really popular in our world today. We think we can do it ourselves. You'll find a lot of people that are willing to share their story about how I have overcome. I have overcome the obstacles in my life and made myself a success. That's not what a personal testimony is about. We're not talking about what I've done. We're talking about what God has done to me and through me. So Paul makes that very clear right from the get-go. This gratitude is something that Paul possesses. It's in the present tense. Now he's going to talk about what happened in the past, but his appreciation is something ongoing. He never forgot where he had come from. He never forgot what Christ had pulled him out of. And then Paul very honestly shares his past. And this is really important because a factually based personal testimony is unanswerable. Internal experience alone is questionable. If you're only talking about, well, I felt this way and then I felt... You know, Nobody can verify feelings, but they can verify facts. And everything Paul says here is factual. These are things where people could go if they wanted to and say, hey, was this really true about Paul? Oh, yeah. Oh, let me tell you about it. So this was something verifiable. And again, his outline is very simple. My life before Christ, my encounter with Christ, my life after Christ. His life before Christ, he summarizes in three expressions, and each one is more intense than the next. Okay? He begins, he says, I was a blasphemer. Blasphemy is one of those words that we've probably heard, but I'll bet most of us don't really know what it's talking about. Because people like me don't do a very good job of explaining it. There's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, which is the unpardonable sin. So it's got to be really, really bad. And you say, no, wait a minute. If Paul was a blasphemer, how did he get forgiven? Well, when Jesus talked about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, it was something very specific that he was warning those people about at that time. They were seeing God the Son in the flesh with their own eyes and attributing his work to the devil. That was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, you do that, you've crossed the line, it's over. Paul wasn't blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy in its generic sense means to speak foolishly or with evil intent against God. So he was acting in such a way. Now, he thought he was doing God a favor. He thought he was serving God, but he was actually working against God. And the things he was saying, particularly about Jesus, before he came to faith in Christ, was slanderous. He was calling Jesus a liar. He was calling Jesus a phony. He's a fake. And that's the sense in which he says, I was a blasphemer. And right now, it's something personal. Here is my view of on this person Jesus. Then the next word ratchets that up a bit. Then it says he was a persecutor. Uh, it's, it's a word, uh, the Greek word translated persecutor isn't found anywhere else. But it comes from a Greek term that means to hunt down. And if you think about what Paul was doing before his conversion, that's exactly what he was doing. He was hunting down Christians arresting them, putting them in jail. Some of them were put to death. And when he didn't find any more Christians to persecute in Jerusalem, he said, let me go to Damascus and do some more. And of course, that's when Jesus got a hold of his life. And then this third word, the NIV translated it as violent. It's a mixture of pride and insolence 
that find satisfaction in insulting and humiliating other people. See, he went from being a blasphemer, which was basically between him and God, to being a persecutor, and now he's a violent man. He was enjoying humiliating other people. He was enjoying persecuting them. A modern equivalent might be a bully. And that's what Paul was. He was a bully against Christians. Now, we might read these words and think, man, pff, you know, they don't mean all that much to us. I mean, I've heard a whole lot worse on America's Most Wanted, right? Uh, sure, there are people that are worse. But remember, we're talking about the Apostle Paul here. This is someone that is usually ranked right below Jesus when it comes to notable people within Christianity, you know, most influential people. You know, he's right up there with Billy Graham, right? Somewhere in that, in that neighborhood. And for him to come out and, and say this about himself uh, would have been quite an impact. Try to imagine this. I, I, I think this might be a, a suitable present-day illustration. We haven't heard so much about them for a few years, but do you remember when ISIS was really big in the Middle East? That jihadist um, Muslim group? They were going around beheading Christians, crucifying some of them literally to put them to death. Imagine the head of ISIS suddenly saying, I've become a Christian. Would you believe him? Most of us wouldn't. Most of us would be thinking, okay, he's got some kind of agenda here. You know, he's going to try to sneak in and find out where all the Christians are and then get his buddies in here and they'll you know, get them all, right? Well, that's exactly what the Christians thought of Saul of Tarsus when all of a sudden he comes back from Damascus and says, oh, hey, by the way, guys, uh, I saw the light and you know, now I'm following Jesus. And they're like, yeah, right. It was unbelievable. It, it would have been very difficult to accept. Or, here's a real life situation. Serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. Convicted of absolutely horrendous crimes. Sentenced to life in prison. And once he's in prison, announces, I've accepted Christ and I've been baptized. That really happened shortly before other prisoners killed him. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God could forgive someone like that? Now, intellectually, theologically, we might say, oh yeah, sure, you know, Jesus can forgive anybody. But think about it. <laughs> think about what this person did. Could God really forgive? forgive that person. That's tough. And it's that kind of character that Paul was before he was saved. Which is why later on in this chapter, in his testimony, he calls himself the chief of sinners. The foremost of sinners. Right there at the top. And what elevated that above everybody else is not just that he took human lives and that he bullied people and he liked watching them suffer, he was doing it against God. I think what cut him right to the heart when God struck him down on that road to Damascus is when he said, Who are you, Lord? And the voice came back and said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. That cut deep. It wasn't just those nameless faces he was putting into jail and maybe putting some to death. It was Jesus. God the Son. And that never left Paul's mind. I wasn't just doing this against men and women. I was doing this against God. And how could anybody be a worse sinner than to persecute God Almighty? That was something he never forgot. Now, 
Paul adds a disclaimer in verse 13, and it may not sit well with us initially. He says, even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. We're like, oh, back up the truck here, Paul. Hold on. Are you really trying to excuse all this for ignorance? Oh, I didn't know what I was doing. No, that's not what Paul's doing. This is not an excuse because nowhere in this testimony or anywhere else where he relays his personal story, does he try to excuse what he did? No, in order to understand this, we need to understand something within Jewish theology. And remember, Paul was first and foremost Jewish. He was an expert in the Jewish law and in their practices. What he's referring to here, and we're not going to read these verses, but if you'd like to jot this down and look it up for yourself, Leviticus chapter 5, verses 15 through 19, and Numbers chapter 15, verses 22 to 31. Leviticus 5, 15 to 19, Numbers 15, 22 to 31. You see, the Jews made a distinction between sins of ignorance and sins done defiantly and presumptuously. And Paul saw his sins in that first category. And again, going back to that initial exchange on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you? He really did not understand until that moment what he was doing to the Son of God. He truly believed that he was serving God. He thought he was doing God a favor by rounding up these heretical Jews following this false Messiah. Now again, he doesn't use that to excuse himself, but what he does show is that he was not disqualified from receiving mercy. In the Jewish doctrine, Unintentional sins could be sacrificed for. But sins of the high hand is the old way of putting it. There was no sacrifice. So Paul is saying, yes, I am the chief of sinners, but I was not so far gone that I could not be saved. That's important when we're sharing our personal testimony with others. Some people will say, well, you don't know my story. I, I was a whole lot worse than you. I've done things you would never believe, even if I told you, and I'm not going to. Paul says, I was the chief of sinners. I was right there at the top, and I could still be forgiven. So Paul is not saying this is an excuse. He is saying, I'm qualified for grace because of the provision that God made there in the law. Now we go on, and Paul says down in, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, uh, verse 15, Jesus Christ came to, in the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. It, this is where John Bunyan got the title for his autobiography, uh, grace abounding to the chief of sinners. He took it right from this passage. And there's no hyperbole here. Paul is expressing the facts with careful precision. He said in Romans 5, where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no conceivable amount of sin that cannot be forgiven by the blood of Christ. His, his blood cleanses us from every sin, from all sin. We are not too far gone for the grace of God. So Paul is very honest in his appraisal about his past and about what God has done for him. 
and, and I can't stress this enough, honesty is essential in our personal testimony. Some of us might be tempted to embellish or exaggerate a little bit to make our testimony sound more impressive. I was saved at the age of four. I was not exactly leading a horrendous life of sin at the age of four. I remember in Bible college, we had an assignment in personal evangelism class, write your testimony, which I did. I got a B minus. And I remember my brother Bob saying, what, weren't you lost enough? And we might say, wow, I've heard these people's testimonies. And, you know, you've got this, you know, drug deal over here and this biker and this murderer and this, you know, all these people. And they, they have such horrible lives of sin and God saved them from them. And here I am and I really don't have much of a testimony. Well, don't make one up, please. And, and you might laugh, but people have. And when they get caught, it ain't pretty. Let me give you an example. When I was in junior high school, there was a guy, he was a comedian, Christian comedian, one of the funniest guys I've ever heard. His name was Mike Warnke. And he had put out a book called The Satan Seller, which described his past. He, he said he was a drug dealer and a, a Satanist high priest before he came to Christ. And uh, he published that book. He went around uh, presenting it, and, and he was a comedian. He was able to tell his story in a very funny way, but then he'd get real serious at the end. Great, great testimony about how God eventually got through to him and his life was changed. And then he told stories about when he was in Vietnam and he was a, a Navy hospital corpsman. Uh, what he didn't realize was that the Marines didn't have hospital corpsmen. They used Navy. So he ended up being in the Marine Corps for three years. And he tells these harrowing stories. And man, he had one album he released called Hey Doc. And it had this great story at the end, you know, and wonderful application. And then years later found out none of it was true. Made the whole thing up. What'd that do to his credibility? But you know what the really sad thing is? Credibility of Christ went right down with it. People who heard that bogus testimony and then found out later, oh, it's not true, they dismissed Christ as much as they dismissed him. And that's why our personal testimony needs to be honest. It needs to be something that can be verified. And if you didn't lead a horrible life of sin, that's okay. Your testimony can be what God saved you from. And it's still powerful. Secondly, a personal testimony is humble. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to, into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Here again, Paul is emphasizing Christ. I'm the worst of sinners, but Christ's grace is even greater than my sin. As horrible as I was, he was greater. And at every point, Jesus is getting the honor and the glory. And you see that this personal testimony is humble. He is emphasizing Christ. He admits he is the worst of sinners. In 1 Corinthians 15.9, he said, I'm the least of all the apostles. In Ephesians 3.8, I'm the least of all the saints. Now, he's not trying to elicit pity. This is not you know, false humility to gain sympathy. He really saw himself that way because of what he was before his salvation. Because he saw himself as the worst of sinners, he felt like I'm the last person in the kingdom that can say anything. And notice, Paul doesn't say I was the worst of sinners. He says I am the worst. 
Even though he had been forgiven, he still realized what he was. And the truth is, we are simply sinners saved by grace. And just like they teach those who are addicted to substances or practices and behaviors, you're always an addict. And someone that's being honest and humble will say, I am an addict. I may not have indulged for years, but I'm still an addict because it would only take one time and I'm right back into that trap. And Paul acknowledges, I am the chief of sinners. And I think this is the healthy thinking of a truly regenerate heart. We never have a sense of superiority. We should never look down on others who are still trapped in sin and think that they are less. But for the grace of God, go I. That could be me. Maybe that was me at one time. And the great news is Christ has saved me from it. It's not because of who I am. Now, does Paul really mean that he's the worst sinner? I mean, are we to take that literally? Or is he just embellishing his sinfulness for effect? You know, we might say, well, you know, Paul, there's no way you could have compared yourself to every sinner in the world. And especially, you know, we think of sinners in our own times. You know, how many people did Paul really put to death? We can find someone who put to death more. You know, some of these tyrants who've killed thousands, even millions of people, well, of course, they would be worse sinners than Paul. That's not the point. The truth is, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, we give up the comparisons to everybody else. We're not trying to say, I'm worse than or better than anybody. We see the reality of our sin. And we realize how bad off we are. It's like the parable Jesus told in Luke 18. The Pharisee stands up and says, I thank God that I'm not like other men. I tithe everything I have. And I'm certainly not like that filthy tax collector over there. There's not an ounce of humility in any of that. And then you have the tax collector that says, God, have mercy on me. And something I did not know until this week. Literally, the Greek says, the sinner. He doesn't say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He, the sinner. Because in his mind, he's the only one that mattered. And I am the sinner who needs grace. So Paul doesn't say this, I'm the worst of sinners, like, I'm comparing myself to everybody else. That could be reverse pride. <laughs> I heard somebody say just today, you know, if you can't be good, just be good at it. And you know, if you're saying you're the worst of sinners, well, that means I'm the best at doing bad. And people could kind of flip that around and be arrogant about it. And that's not what Paul is saying at all. What he is saying is I was as bad off as anybody can be. And if Christ could save me, he can save you. That's the point that he's making here. Then he says that Christ saved him as an example. He's actually a prototype. And this ought to be a part of our personal testimony. Not just this happened to me, but this can happen for you. There's a lot of people today that says, oh, well, I'm glad that happened to you and I'm glad that's, you know, I'm glad that's your truth. That phrase drives me what do you mean, your truth? Like there's multiple versions of truth? That's what we're being told in our culture. Oh, live out your truth. Discover and find your truth. Hey, there's only one truth. And the truth is found in God's Word. And the truth is, Christ died for sinners. And the blood of Christ Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So Paul is sharing that truth, using himself as an example, saying, you might think that you're bad off, you're not any worse off than I was, and God forgave me, he can forgive you as well. Now Paul does mention here, and I think this is also important in our personal testimony, 
Salvation requires belief in Christ. Yes, Jesus died for the whole world, but the whole world isn't going to get saved. It's only those who put their faith in Jesus that can claim that forgiveness. And then finally, a personal testimony is honoring. Take a look at verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul assured Timothy and the church at Ephesus that this gospel came not from his own greatness, but from God. God's grace overcame all the apostles' sin, his personal shortcomings, and all the glories going back to him. Remember, the beginning of his testimony, I thank Christ Jesus my Lord. In the middle, Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I'm the worst, and then at the end, Given glory to God. A personal testimony ought to be honoring to God. And anyone who has a growing comprehension of the holiness of God will also understand their own sinfulness before Him. The closer one gets to the light, the more dirt one sees. Paul lived so near to the heart of God that he couldn't help but see the own desperate need of his, of his heart. And let's never forget that in this confession, Paul was not magnifying his sinfulness. He was magnifying the grace and the mercy of God. And bottom line, that's what our personal testimony ought to do. It should not be, look at me, a great sinner. Look at him, a great Savior. And so a personal testimony always brings the honor and the glory to God. We need to be careful not to allow our personal testimonies to be a commemoration of our sinfulness instead of a celebration of God's grace. We should never be the star of our own testimony. And I've even been in some churches where they have testimony time, people stand up and give their testimonies, and it's almost like one-upsmanship, you know. Oh, well, that person was bad, but let me tell you how bad I was, you know. And then it's like, can you top this? That's not what testimonies are all about. It's how great... God is. All the praise and the glory goes to Him. You know, each Christian's spiritual history is filled with touching reminders of God's grace and mercy. And we're not living in the past, but from time to time, we're going to need to relate our experiences that have brought us to where we are. Paul's testimony here demonstrated the power of of that message that he was fighting for in the verses previous. Paul knew in his own heart he was convinced that this message was true. Now, taking the opportunity for a personal testimony, you know, that might even be more productive than asking somebody to come to church. I'm not saying you shouldn't ask people to come to church. I'm saying they may be more interested in hearing your story than coming here and listening to me especially if they know you already. They've established some trust. They don't know me from Adam. But if they know you and they know your story and, and they've seen in your life, you know, that person's different. You know, I, 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 I kind of like to be more like her. I'd like to be more like him. Hearing how you got there can be far more powerful than any sermon from this pulpit. And that's why it's so important that we be witnesses. If you're going to prepare your testimony, think through how you would say it. Remember those three main points. My life before Christ, how I came to Christ, my life after Christ. Keep it concise. You don't need to preach a sermon. But be honest, be humble, be honoring to God. You might want to practice, and I know this sounds really weird. I practice my testimony? Yeah. Find someone, maybe within the church or even within your own family, and practice telling your story. Because the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be at doing it. And then pray that the Holy Spirit will open up opportunities that you can share what God has done for you. Something wonderful happens when we share our personal story of salvation with others. Share that. And don't forget to make God the hero. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer?
Heavenly Father, each one of us who has your Son as our Savior has a story to tell. And each story is unique, unlike any others. But what is consistent is that you are the Savior. You forgive whatever sins we have committed in our past. Your grace is greater than our sin. I pray that in the days and the weeks to come, you would impress upon us the importance of putting together our personal testimony and then give us opportunities to share it. Prepare the hearts of others to hear what you have done in our lives so that they might turn to you to be saved. And we pray this not for our own benefit, for our own uh, honor, but for your glory. That others might come to know you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.